So hydrogen has a huge potential. Uh, and I feel that it'll be a key part of the decarbonized energy mix of the future. Um, and as you say, we had increased uh, targets, ambitions in the strategy published yesterday. Um, and I think there's a huge interest, and not just in the UK, there's huge interest globally. You know, people in Germany, Austria, you know, want to wean themselves off Russian hydrocarbons. And clearly, if the hydrogen economy gets going, and we can uh, derive fuel from hydrogen. That's a very easy way of reducing uh, dependence on Russian gas. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm Dan Monzani, Managing Director for UK and Ireland at Aurora Energy Research. The last few weeks have seen energy policy at the centre of global news in a way probably not seen since the 1970s. The war in Ukraine, sharp increases in global gas prices, and the latest warnings about climate change in the IPCC report have given policymakers cause to reflect on both energy security and the pace of transition to net zero. And in the UK, this week saw the publication of a much anticipated energy security strategy by the UK government. And as I speak to you today on uh, Friday, the 8th of April, uh, that's only 24 hours old. So I'm absolutely delighted to be able to welcome to the podcast this week, the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, Kwasi Kwarteng. Secretary of State, welcome to Energy Unplugged. Really good to see you again, Dan. And uh, I think uh, it's going to be a very interesting conversation. Uh, It's a very uh, live and exciting time uh, for energy specialists like yourself uh, and for ministers, officials like me. Um, and I'm looking forward very much to the conversation. Well, that's that's great. And firstly, congratulations on getting the energy security strategy out. I know how, uh, how much work goes into these things and only a few months after the net zero strategy as well. Um, it, it, there's a lot we could cover in there. I, I plan to focus on a few things. First of all, let's let's start with the immediate crisis and the the winter ahead. But then um, I'd like to talk about a lot of the longer term investments in electricity security and the climate crisis uh, that were the focus point of your report. And then we'll perhaps wrap up with some thoughts on your own sort of guiding political philosophy on uh, on the energy transition, if that's okay. Perfect. Great. Well, let's start with security of gas supply then, because this is the thing front of mind across across Europe in particular. Uh, Germany and Austria uh, had to issue a warning last week that they may need to interrupt gas supplies for some users. And now, obviously, they use a lot more Russian gas than here in the UK. But are you completely confident in the uh, UK's secure access to physical supply of yeah. gas for the next winter? So, so, so two things here. I mean, clearly, if you can, if you look around Europe, uh, you, we have the UK ourselves, where roughly about three to five percent of our gas comes from Russia in the form of liquefied natural gas, LNG, which is transported on ships. In Germany, Austria, and particularly in Hungary, uh, their gas comes from Russia through a pipeline, uh, Nord Stream 1. Um, And in the case of Germany, and I spoke to the German energy minister, the economy minister he is actually, uh, the vice chancellor, Robert Habeck, a very good leader. He said to me only last week that 55% of their gas uh, comes uh, from Russia. So that's a much bigger dependency on Russian gas than we uh, than us in the UK. So in terms of where we get our, our gas physically from, it's not from Russia generally, only 3% is or 4%. But clearly what happens uh, to uh, Russian gas and, uh, uh, will affect the global price. Uh, and we saw that all through uh, the end of uh, last year. We've seen it again in patches this year. And so we're exposed to Russian gas in the sense that we're exposed to global prices, which often are affected by what uh, Vladimir Putin says or or does in relation to uh, gas production. One one of the things that caught my eye in the the international section of your strategy yesterday was um, a commitment to working closely with the US on gas and in, in particular to leveraging the UK's LNG infrastructure to That's support right. European allies. Um, That's right. We've actually done some some analysis on our physical capacity to export to Europe, uh, yeah. even after 
meeting our own demand. And, and it looks like we can re-export 48 billion cubic meters of natural gas this summer. But over the winter, we're a bit more constrained. Um, That's right. and, and so we, 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 there's probably a, an 11 billion cubic meter unused export capacity. What, what are the measures? I mean, firstly, is it a, is it a goal of your security strategy to help Europe? Um, or, or is it mostly about making sure British consumers have secure supplies? Our first duty, obviously, is to um, have a measure of security and independence here in the UK. But clearly, given what's happened uh, with Russia, with uh, Vladimir Putin, with Ukraine, you know, we're very supportive of friends and colleagues in Europe uh, weaning themselves off, in the Prime Minister's phrase, uh, Russian hydrocarbons. So clearly, we also have a responsibility to help colleagues and allies um, get other sources of gas. Um, and reduce their reliance on Russian uh, gas production and oil production. Would you, would you be relaxed if that meant burning, say, more coal in, in British power stations over the next winter or two, and closing them on time, but using coal to yeah. substitute for gas? So, look, I think, I think there are two things we have to distinguish. There's obviously the, the longer-term goal of net zero, but there's also a short-term, there are short-term constraints on supply which could force up prices exorbitantly, and they have done, actually. And so we've got to try and uh, mitigate that. We've got to try and intervene so that we, we, or to an extent, so that we can, we're shielded from the excessive uh, increases in, in prices. Now, we've done that with the price cap. You will know that the, the, the retail price cap does actually shelter or shield people from high rises in, in gas, uh, wholesale gas prices. Um, but another way of doing this is making sure that we've got capacity and, um, you know, the, the, the whole question of, of, of coal is one that, uh, you know, crops up. Now, I think that our, our broad uh, target is, is 2024, and I think we can still maintain that, regardless of whether uh, we use coal this winter or not. I you, there's been some commentary following the strategy that some people would have liked to have seen a bit more on energy efficiency or yeah, onshore think, winds. Yeah. Would you have liked to have gone further on those? Look, I think on energy efficiency, I mean, I mean, you all know, because you know the department very well, we had a heat of building strategy. We had a whole strategy, a document, published only last year. I think it was even in October. I don't think it was even that long ago. It was maybe six months ago. On precisely this question of energy efficiency. So I was surprised that even quite knowledgeable uh, commentators made that point, um, but I understand it. But but of course, you know the security strategy was what it said on the on on the on its cover. It was about security of supply, and it was about generating capacity. I mean, most of the the twenty six pages or whatever, however long it was, um, were focused uh, almost exclusively on on um, electricity generation and power supply. Yes, um, and, 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 and on onshore so, wind. Uh, yeah, onshore wind as well. We, we we mentioned that. I mean, people say we could have been more ambitious. I think we were quite ambitious. You will remember we had uh, a ban on the pot, pot one auction, which we lifted uh, only two years ago. Um, so we have made some progress on on onshore wind, and we've outlined in the strategy how uh, we can go further on that. But the but the key bit of that is the is the principle that local communities um, will 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 have to be consulted and will have to consent. Uh, to uh, on the more rapid deployment, more extensive deployment of onshore wind. The other thing I noticed, um, which has the potential to substitute for either um, diesel or, or for gas, was your raised commitments on hydrogen, um, yeah. including a, a gigawatt of electrolytic hydrogen by 2025. Um, yeah, that's quite how, how ambitious. That, yes. How do, how do you think that's best likely to be used on the, you know, who, who's going to... So my, my I mean... Hydrogen has, has really come leaps and bounds, actually, in the last two years. I mean, when you'll remember at the beginning of 2020, we only had one person in the hydrogen team. I remember coming into my office uh, at the beginning of, of, uh, of, of 2020 and saying, look, I think hydrogen is going to be a big thing. And, and Rita Whaley, who you know, um, and sadly, I think she's, uh, well, anyway, she, I think she's still in the department, but, but she, she, she was the only person there. So we've expanded it dramatically. Uh, there are dozens of people in the team. And I think if hydrogen and, and a lot of the trials that we're, I just read today, that the trials of blending hydrogen into natural gas for heat, uh, the, the, the gas distribution network, there's a trial up in Newcastle, uh, which is working really well. We've got further trials 
where we're looking at exclusive 100% hydrogen uh, through the gas uh, pipes um, to heat uh, you know, model villages, that sort of thing. So hydrogen has a huge potential. Uh, and I feel that um, it's, it'll be a key part of the, the decarbonized energy mix of the future. Um, and as you say, we had increased uh, targets, ambitions in the strategy published yesterday. Um, and I think there's a huge interest, and not just in the UK, there's huge interest globally. Because as you mentioned, you know, people in Germany, Austria, um, uh, you know, want to wean themselves off Russian hydrocarbons. And clearly, if the hydrogen economy gets going, and we can, we can uh, derive fuel from hydrogen, that's a very easy way of reducing uh, dependence on Russian gas. You see an export opportunity in the same way as we can export see an export. Yeah. I, I definitely see an If we can get ahead of the production um, and be one of the uh, largest producers of it, there's definitely an export opportunity. Um, and whether that's through, um, you know, sending it around uh, on ships in the form of, um, you know, liquefied ammonia or whatever it is, or whether it's through pipes, um, there's definitely there's definitely an opportunity, a long term opportunity here. So, so this is partly about substituting the gas in the short run or, or for diesel if it's used in transport, but actually much more about building that longer term plan again. I think it's a longer term uh, issue. I think hydrogen can transform the energy space. And just in answer to your question about where will it be uh, used, I, I suspect it'll be used initially in the industrial clusters. So we've got right. uh, industrial clusters in Teesside, the Humber, uh, where... Uh, there will be carbon capture and of course the carbon capture then essentially is a kind of the other side of the corner of the blue hydrogen production mm -hmm. and the blue hydrogen production initially will be used on site either uh, through uh, you know decarbonizing industry as, as, a, as, a, as a power source for industry or um, in, in, in some forms of transportation you know particularly with buses and, and heavy goods vehicles. Final question on the on the short run. Um, you mentioned the price cap, but I mean that's just gone up by fifty four percent. Very very steep rises. Very possible steep rises. Uh, possible for more in the autumn as well. Uh, it must be hurting uh, energy intensives as, as well. Um, the government's made some steps here. Do, do you think the government might need to come back to this again later in the year and, and look to cushion that blow, spread some of those costs over the long run? I think we're always looking at. Um, Conditions because we, the way that markets have moved only in the last six months, um, nobody could have predicted uh, where we would be um, in June, July. I remember the price creeping up, but it was creeping up to sort of, you know, maybe 100 pence a therm. That seemed very high at the time. And then, of course, in the last six months, it's, it's reached for, at one point, I think 800 pence a therm yeah, is the highest. Does. And it's, it's consistently sort of trading around 250. So, you know, we have no idea where gas prices will be in two or three months time, let alone six months time. And so it would be, I think, foolhardy to say, we're never going to look at this when we're, we're, we're not reviewing uh, data constantly. So you're right, we, we, you know, we, we, we've established what we'll do, but we're, we're constantly reviewing uh, the market and seeing what's happening. Brilliant. Let, let's turn to the strategy then and the, and the longer term uh, announcements on electricity security. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of big technology announcements. Um, so let's take each of those in, in turn, firstly on uh, wind and then on, then on nuclear. You, you've announced an increased target of 50 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. That's yeah. quadrupling our current operational fleet. Um, yeah. I'm trying to say a race for renewables to match the dash for gas in the 90s. But, um, yeah, what, but I think it's doable because you see, okay. we've, we've got about 11 gigawatts of installed capacity now, but we've, we've got about 16 or 17 in the pipeline. Hmm. So, you know, you've got the nine gigawatts from, I think, the um, third auction round, um, and then uh, and before, and then you've got the seven gigawatts from this last auction round, which will be decided upon this year. And so on top of the 11, you've got 16 coming down the pipeline. That gets to about 28. Uh, we'll have more auction rounds, obviously. Uh, we've, we've moved to an annual auction round. That was something I was very keen to do. Uh, and we, we've moved to that as of next year. And we've also got a, a, a higher um, target for floating offshore. So the floating offshore uh, wind target has gone from one gigawatt to five gigawatts of capacity. And, and it's, a, it's a stretch target. It's a difficult target to meet, but I think it's doable. And you announced um, a number of ambitions on, well, 
planning and network. So on planning and trying to get the, the planning commission down from four years to one years. Um, yeah. Do you have a clear idea how you'll do that yet or, or is that still work in progress? I think we're still working on that. But as I said, there's plenty of stuff in the offshore wind pipeline to really land these projects even ahead of any planning uh, reform. So, you know, if we, even if we reform planning tomorrow, these projects are still in the pipeline. Uh, and I think planning reform will, ha will have uh, a greater impact at the end of the, the decade and beyond than it will do in, 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 the, in the immediate three or four years, uh, you know, through, through the mid 2020s. Some of the kinds of things our clients um, mentioned to us on, on those planning barriers are, are sort of requirements that are there for good reasons, like protecting wild birds, for example, but, yeah. but might lead to things like having to leave a, an artificial nest up for four years before they can actually commission their wind site. Is it, is it that kind of trade-off you might look at? Um, I, look, I think it's very challenging because, you know, yeah. we're, we're not, you know, we're not a totalitarian country uh, and we're a country also that takes really, you know, respects and cares for its environment. I mean, this would be much easier if we could just impose all these things without any regard to the environment or, or local consent or anything like that. We, we would just get it done. But we're not that sort of country, thankfully. Uh, and we have to get a measure of consent. And we also have to be mindful uh, and respectful of our natural environment. So, you know, I think there's a balance. I think, I think you know, we can't just simply go at breakneck speed you know, ignoring all those other considerations. But at the same time, we've got to balance, um, you know, the need for speed, as it were, um, with, with environmental protections. And it's always a, it's always a difficult, uh, you know, a thing to do. I mean, it's, you, you need to have a debate, you may be challenged, uh, but that's, that's what, what it means to live in a democracy. Another really important part of this um, is strategic network planning. And a um, couple of things here, um, one, I noticed you'd committed to setting out a blueprint by the end of 2022 on holistic network design and the centralized strategic network plan, which have the added benefit of adding another couple of acronyms to the lexicon, but um, <laughs> hopefully significantly more than that. Yeah, I think it's and important one... to think of. Yeah, I think it's important to think of the energy system as a whole. Yes, um, and and actually one of the problems that many energy specialists have observed is that it's sort of grown piecemeal. So there are lots of different markets. There's lots of different um, networks. Um, and we have we we probably need to have a more integrated uh, vision of it. And to that end, I, I was really pleased to see the announcement of the um, uh, independent uh, electricity system operator or energy system operator. Now you're adding uh, gas network planning functions as well. I know that's something you've been working on for a number of years since you were energy minister. Yeah. I've been very pleased to bring that to fruition. You, you, you'll remember, actually, I think it was within a month or two of my uh, being appointed energy minister. We had these um, power outages, blackouts. Uh, I think it was August 2019, and about a million commuters were, were essentially sat in the dark, not for very long, but it was pretty miserable uh, to be going home on a Friday night and then the train essentially just be stopped and black and, and not the lights go out. And I remember at the time, uh, it was all about obviously the national grid, and of course the ESO sat sits as it does within the national grid. I remember being relatively new to energy policy um, and thinking, well, that's quite strange that you know, you'd have a, a, a system operator that, that sat in a private company. And my analogy, because I, was, I know and I had a financial background, was that we wouldn't tolerate having the Bank of England as a subdivision of HSBC or Goldman Sachs or whichever bank. I mean, people would think that was absurd. Yet for historic reasons, we've been in this position where the ESO was sitting uh, in National Grid. And of course, when, when, when the ESO started off in National Grid, National Grid was a public company. But then once it was privatized, it managed to keep uh, the ESO, which was you know, an interesting uh, corporate um, configuration. Now, people realized that, and a few years ago, a few years before I became the energy minister, they, they, they had a sort of separation of op operation uh, accountability from uh, within within the national grid, so the ESO is a separate uh, operating uh, entity uh, to the rest of the business. And as, a, as someone again who was exposed to finance, I thought even from the national grid point of view, you, you, your ex reputation, you were exposed to what the ESO did or didn't do, but at the same time, you had no operational control over it. 
And if I were a shareholder of the National Grid, I thought that was quite strange. And I, I made those points in 2019. And we've had a, lots of discussions about the role of the ESO, you know, what it could do, um, how we could evolve it. And I'm, as you say, I'm very pleased that all of those discussions, and I have to say National Grid were extremely cooperative. You know, John Pettigrew and his team were extremely engaged. Uh, Vinton Sly as well, who's the head of the ESO, they, they couldn't have been more uh, cooperative and um, forthcoming in, in setting out their ideas as to how this might happen. And we're not there yet. I mean, there's still a, a way to go. But I think, you know, announcing this in the strategy was really exciting. and um, 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 it, it shows the, the amount of uh, uh, land we've traversed on this. And, and I'm, I'm pleased about that. I mean, a big institutional change and uh, another institutional change was um, setting up a new body to help push nuclear forwards. Um, yeah. You've again raised uh, raised targets there to about 25% yeah. of annual output by 2050, quite, actually quite similar to the Aurora forecast, I'll say in, I'll say in passing. Um, oh, is that right? Did you, did you get that? Number? We probably got it from you, didn't we? We probably just... Like, almost certainly. We just probably looked at your work and put it in the, in the strategy. Look, I think the 25% I'm sure that's how it works. I think the 25% is very ambitious. So, you know, even uh, today, it's about 15%, okay? So, and a lot of that capacity is coming off this decade. Uh, so in order just to keep at the same level, keep the nuclear as a same proportion in the, in the generating mix as it is today, we would have to build a, a large number, well, not a large number, but sort of two or three larger um, gigawatt reactors, uh, gigascale reactors. And, and on top of that, we've obviously got this new technology, the small modular reactor. Um, and I think between them, the small modular reactor and larger reactors, we can get to the 25%. I think it's a, it's a big target. Um, and and, and the 25% the, the is, is derived from what the capacity figure is in 2050. Uh, yeah. Today, it's roughly, roughly 45, 50 gigawatts, that sort of area. Uh, in 2050, back of the envelope, we're saying it could be 100. And that's why the 24 gigawatts translates into whatever it is, 25% of, 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 of the capacity, um, you know, 24 being very close to 25. And it's roughly the back of the envelope uh, uh, calculations would suggest that we would be having a capacity of 100 gigawatts, uh, which is, is not unreasonable. And, and we're growing the, the nuclear base to, to, to 24 gigawatts. Fantastic. I, I'm going to turn from um, from the big low carbon technologies, the, the the bulk providers of electricity, to some of the things you talked about on market reform. Um, yeah. I was um, uh, I, I was interesting to see a commitment to a comprehensive review of electricity market arrangements. And I, I know a few energy specialists have picked up on this as well. What are the main questions you're looking for that review to answer? Well, I think that the way the electricity market works is is interesting because. For historic reasons, I think, uh, every, the, the, the real sort of price giver in this whole space is the gas price. Everything is priced off the gas price. And you will know that how we, we, we buy and sell gas is a, is a legacy function from many years ago. And the, the gas market is changing. It's much more of a forward market uh, than, than, it, than, than a spot market, even though all our pricing is, is essentially based off the spot price. Uh, and so I think, you know, there is a legitimate reason uh, to be looking at electricity pricing and, 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 and how the market, how the market works. There's a couple of different areas, and I know you haven't done the review yet, so I, I'm, I'm interested to see what's on the table rather than trying to probe you for final answers. But there's a, there's a set of proposals that try and get more signals into the wholesale uh, market. So, for example, the ESO um, recently um, said it, it, it thought it was sensible to move to zonal or nodal pricing so to yeah. divide a national one price into into a number of regional ones that represent the local imbalances between supply and demand yeah no. um and people like octopus energy and others have pressed for more um dynamic pricing at a household level um yeah. at different times of day are, are those kind of things that bring more signals into the wholesale market yeah i think um, so but also the, 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 it, it makes the system cheaper to operate i mean a world where you have quite rigid um, national prices which stay the same regardless of demand, demand or, or supply at any single point. That's quite a rigid system. 
and it, and it builds quite a lot of cost into the system. Whereas a, 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 a world where you have more nodal pricing, and I don't know about the technicalities of that because I think it's quite a tricky thing to, to achieve, but, um, but it should be looked into where you have more localized pricing or you have more continuous pricing, which reflects the supply and demand for electricity at any, at any moment. You know, that is going to be a much less or rather much more energy um, efficient system. Yes. One in which you're just simply paying the same amount of money regardless of underlying supply and demand. Um, I mean, that intuition totally makes sense. And if we're serious about net zero and energy efficiency and having a more nimble system, um, then we have to probably examine, uh, you know, more what the economists call price discrimination. Uh, you know, say that if you charge your phone on a, on a, on a Wednesday morning at 2 a.m., it, you're probably gonna, it's going to cost you less than if you were to do the same thing let's say on a Friday night where people use a lot more electricity. But at the moment, it's just the same blanket price. Uh, so I, I, think, I think there is a lot of work we can do to make a more nimble system that reflects um, actual you know, economic activity in the moment. And that feels really important with your other commitment to um, a, a, an electric vehicle mandate. I, I, I think the numbers suggest over half of new sales being electric by 2028. Yes. And so... Uh, you know, that growth in the you're, electricity you're absolutely system is right. happening now. Exactly. So you're in a world where you've got, let's say, half of the car sales being electric in six years' time. And it's not inconceivable. I think it's something that could very much happen. I mean, the, uh, there's been a massive acceleration in the purchase of, of EVs. But that world needs to, probably needs to have a huge amount of more electricity capacity. But if you're going to have that, it needs to be more efficient. Um, you know, we don't, uh, and so in order to have uh, or make it more efficient, we probably have to have more continuous pricing uh, and more variation uh, in terms of you know how how we pay for you know charging electricity or even putting a kettle on. The, the other extreme you may have seen it actually takes more signals out of the market and and, and has more done uh, by regulators. So. The Spanish government, for example, has proposed capping the prices that gas generators can charge in the wholesale market. Yeah, they have. And that's to sort of prevent extra normal profits for zero marginal cost generators. So that's not a cap on retail prices for the benefit of listeners, but actually on the wholesale price itself. And then you have to sort of make good the gas generators for their lost um, for their losses outside of the market. Um, that's sort of the other extreme, if you like, from interesting. That's something which, market. you know, I mean, you, you know, government, you know, the British government, you worked in it for, what, 20 years, something like that. Yeah. You know, just, just looking at your question, um, you can see that that would expose the taxpayer to a huge amount of risk, balance sheet risk, because essentially you're making whole the generator, you know, the generator's losses um, because that you've imposed on them effectively. And so, and you, you, you know how, how Treasury thinks, you know how the British government thinks about these things. Can you imagine a Treasury agreeing to expose uh, UK ta- uh, HMG uh, and taxpayers to that kind of balance sheet risk? No, it, it doesn't. It, it doesn't in, work world, in, in our system, it's very unlikely. I'm not saying it's impossible, mm. but I think it's very unlikely that we would, we, 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 we would undergo um, that policy. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. We might we might turn actually in that case to guiding philosophies as a sort of way of closing out on yeah. uh, on on the podcast. Uh, regular listeners might know um, uh, we play a game occasionally called over or under, where we ask our guests to say whether a concept is over or underrated. Yeah, that's I, great. I, I, I think I'm going to make it a little bit more complicated for you, uh, okay, which, is put, <laughs> which is to give you a sliding scale um, uh, between naught and ten, and yeah. to see where you are. On that scale, um, where zero is not at all and ten is is completely, okay. but I'm only going to ask you about three concepts. So okay, good. Are you all right for that? Yeah, fine. So, Depends so on what the concepts all, are. Oh well, it does, doesn't it? You can <laughs> ask the questions, questions, but I don't have to answer them. I mean, that's that's generally the, the okay. rule these days. <laughs> Um, first one is the importance of institutions. So, I mean, you get regular advice from the CCC on your carbon plans. You've just made the system operator yeah. independent. So. Um, where zero is institutional structures don't matter significantly. It's all about individuals. And I'm on an eight is, on that. I'm on an, in, in, an energy, in, all, in an energy system, 
I think you need to have institutions. You need to have frameworks. You need to have regulation. You need to have um, a sort of certainty of um, you know, predictability so far, because these are very volatile markets. So I think institutions, I'd be seven or eight on that. Second, uh, taxes as an active tool in the energy transition. Zero is taxes is all about minimizing distortions. Taxes are generally bad. Ten is actually this is a way of guiding behavior. Carbon taxes are the key to decarbonize. Yeah, I don't like I don't like tax. So so generally, I think three or four. I think in in in, in where we have made great strides. If I look at the last 30, 40 years, we've made quite a lot of strides in regulation, actually. You know, we've supported things like the CFD, we've, we've created structures, we've um, incentivized, uh, we've tried to incentivize you know, decarbonizing of buildings. But a lot of that, the heavy lifting has been done through regulation, uh, which I'm obviously not opposed to. But, but taxes uh, per se are things that I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a great fan of. Obviously you have to impose them, but um, I, I, I think it's quite a blunt instrument. Um, and uh, so I'd be three or four on that. But just to, just to probe that a little bit, um, presumably where you're doing it, you want them to be consistent. You, you've talked about levelling up levies, for example, between gas yeah. and electricity. Yeah. Well, I have, but I, 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 I want them to be consistent, but I also want them to be quite low. I mean, if, yeah. if, if in any system, your, most of your heavy lifting is through taxation, the state basically becomes a great big redistribution mechanism. Because you're 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 gathering huge amounts of money, and then you're distributing it in ways that the, 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 that essentially the man or woman in Whitehall is deciding, um, and and that's not a, that to me is like a socialist approach generally crudely, um, and that's not what uh, I believe in. I don't, I, don't, I don't think it's it's that effective. But we're talking, we're talking well quite high it. level. We're talking yeah, quite high level. So you know, I'm just talking about broad principles. Now, of course. We tax, we we spend, we redistribute yeah. stuff, all of that. But in, in terms of a principle and as an approach, I think you know gathering huge amounts of taxpayers' money to, to re redistribute it um, is not the most efficient way necessarily of getting of reaching outcomes. That's my my bias. But you yeah. know, in a complicated modern economy, and uh, you know one does that all the time. Yes, you have to you have to have a bit of a mixed economy, don't you? But yeah. Um, in the final one, uh, I wanted to talk to you about a bit, a bit more. We've talked about it all the way through, actually, about markets and policy, and it's definitely something you've <coughs> thought and written a lot about. So you um, you were the co-author of Britannia Unchained, which was yeah, strongly was. Pr a free market, but then yeah. quipped a few years later that there's nothing better to convert someone uh, from being a radical free marketeer to see the virtues of government action than making them energy minister. So yeah. where That's are you good. on the scale now between Look, total free markets and zero? Right? To that. I, I think free markets generally are very, very good and, and are great engines of growth and wealth creation. Um, I think an energy market, because of the nature of, you know, the crucial nature of energy and the fact that there are lots of balancing interests, there's a very volatile market. I think uh, an energy market um, needs regulation. I mean, that seems self-evident um uh, but and actually i think uh, injecting a bit more free market type structures into the energy market like the price discrimination point we're making yeah. uh, continuous pricing that that actually would be more efficient so I, I don't see the two being in conflict but the idea that you could have a, a kind of wild west in, of energy policy where the government just didn't do anything um is uh, is completely un, uh, unrealistic no but at the other extreme you don't see a an entirely yeah. state plans. Um, no, I, that's exactly right. So, so between, you know, I don't know, I can't think of a, a you know, Victorian England or whatever, and, and so the Soviet Union uh, in the in the sixties, there there was definitely a middle way, and I would probably yeah. tend to more of a market, a free market approach. Um, but but you, you, one extreme I, I don't think works, and the other extreme doesn't work. Secretary of State, that's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you very much for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you, Dan. Uh, it was really good to talk to you about energy and uh, it's always uh, very interesting to do so. So thank you. That was Dan Monzani, Managing Director for UK and Ireland at Aurora, talking to Kwasi Kwarteng, UK Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. 
Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.